Even She's the Man, which is high goddamn art, let me tell you. You think I'd just say that shit if I can't wax lyrical about it for 40 minutes? Get out! Let's talk about She's the Man. She's the Man is a 2006 teen romantic comedy directed by Andy Fickman, written by Ewan Leslie, Karen McCullough, and Kirsten Smith, and loosely based on William Shakespeare's play Twelfth Night. Amanda Bynes Viola. Okay, three words in and I already gotta stop me right there. In Twelfth Night, this character's name is Viola, which you can tell because of the way her name fits into the iambic pentameter, where the stress is pretty consistently on the first beat. Viola. And say thrice welcome drowned Viola, and died that day when Viola from her birth had numbered 13 years, that I am Viola, which to confirm, y you get it. Verse isn't totally ironclad, but it is sort of a superpower once you know what you're doing with it. But in She's the Man, her name is Viola, like halfway between the Shakespearean name and the string instrument. Viola? Viola! Viola! Viola. Hi, it's Viola. Viola! Hastings! So that's gonna be really difficult for me, but the upside is when we talk about the play in a minute, there will be a clear distinction between the two characters. Okay. Viola is a rising 12th grader and star of her school Cornwall's girls soccer team, which has been cut this year due to lack of interest. And the boys team coach is a massive dickhead who refuses to even entertain the notion of allowing Viola and her friends to try out and turn the team co-ed if they prove they're good enough. You're all excellent players, but... Girls aren't as fast as boys. Meanwhile, Viola's twin brother Sebastian, an aspiring rock star who got kicked out of Cornwall for cutting class, recruits Viola to impersonate their mother and contact his new school, Illyria, with a reasonable excuse for why he's gonna miss the first two weeks of the school year while he's actually in London playing a music festival. He thinks I'm staying at Dad's, Dad thinks I'm staying at Mom's. In two days, they both think that I'm going away to school. That is the beauty of divorce. Viola decides to solve one problem with another by impersonating her brother and and joining the Illyria boys soccer team, which luckily enough is scheduled for a rivalry game against Cornwall in two weeks. Her new roommate, Channing Tatum's Duke, offers to help Viola as Sebastian train up enough to make first string in time for the game if she helps him get a date with his crush, Laura Ramsey's Olivia. This backfires when Olivia catches feelings for the sweet, sensitive, and starved for female friendship would-be Sebastian. Ooh, cute shoes. Oh, you think so? I got my anthropology. No way, they have shoes there? Oh, yeah, right by the accessories. Huh. <clears throat> <clears throat> Here are your books. And Viola falls pretty dang hard for Duke. Hijinks ensue as everyone preps for both the big game and the cotillion Viola's mother has strong-armed her into participating in, and Viola and Sebastian's nightmare exes Justin and Monique keep constantly turning up to wreak havoc. The real Sebastian returns from London just before the Cornwall game, hijinks reach a fever pitch, the deception is revealed, Viola gets to play and score the winning point as herself, and everyone is set up in straight-passing couples for cotillion if Duke can find forgiveness in his heart. Who are we kidding? Of course he can! And the happy couple kick ass on the soccer field off into the sunset. So this movie is one of those delightful little time capsules that is just guaranteed to send me and a lot of folks around my age into an absolute nostalgic tailspin. Like, remember that three year period when this song was in like every movie for teenagers? Can't stop this. Like, it wasn't on the radio. This band didn't do anything else that anyone cared about so far as I know, but I found three separate official music videos made up of film clips on YouTube. And blessedly, it's one of those time capsules that has aged all right in its bunker. You know, there's at least one unpleasant female stereotype, but there are lots of other girls too. The racial diversity of the cast leaves much to be desired, but there's little to no overt racism. Queer characters are silent sidelined but exist, at least to the modern day standards of the Disney company. A lot of the less kind jokes are more unexamined than mean, so they can kind of play as accidentally based if you put your mind to it. Malcolm, have you ever tried to run away in high heels? No, sir. I, Not I that easy. 
not that easy. You know, it's not like you're not gonna cringe a little, but you'll probably laugh more. It is 15 years old, but not the worst 15 years. It's also a tongue-in-cheek Shakespeare adaptation, and a team of twinks and studio blacks will come and forcibly confiscate my BFA if I don't say something about that. So, here's a quick rundown of Easter eggs and a sprinkling of analysis. <laughs> Shakespeare's Duke Orsino is a duke who is named Orsino. Very clever. The play's Olivia is in mourning for the death of her brother, which, I mean, when you're in high school is emotionally not too far off a bad breakup. She was dating this college guy, but he dumped her, and I hear she's a total mess right now, like really vulnerable. Illyria is the main location of both stories, but in the play it's an island nation, not a high school. Shakespeare's Viola and Sebastian are separated by a shipwreck, and Viola cross-dresses because... Oh god, this is complicated and up for debate, but if my college notes are to be trusted. Her parents are dead, and she's too young to inherit and make her own way in the world, so she needs the protection of someone with a title until she comes of age. And Olivia isn't seeing visitors, much less job applicants, while she's in mourning, so Viola's only choice is the Duke. But since he's unmarried, it would be improper for him to have a woman in the household, so Viola needs to disguise herself as a boy. Since she's not impersonating her brother specifically, she gets to pick her own name, and she goes with Cesario, which She's the Man uses as the name of the local pizza place. Very cute. And early in the movie, there's a poster in the background for a school play called What You Will, which is the second half of the full title of Twelfth Night. Toby and Andrew are the names of characters in both stories, but in the play they are Olivia's friends, specifically her uncle and his drinking buddy who he's trying to set up with her, but their drunken shenanigans are pretty in line with the vibes of Duke's jock friends. The movie's Toby also eventually pairs off with Eunice, who is probably the closest thing the movie has to the play's Mariah, Olivia's lady's maid and Toby's love interest, which is a fun little detail. Well, actually, there is a character named Maria who's a friend of Olivia's, but she's only in one scene and they never say her name. You have to go read the credits for that, so I still get to be right. Viola's friend Paul takes his last name from Antonio, escorted by Paul Antonio, the sailor in Twelfth Night who saves Sebastian's life and also is definitely in love with him, and Paul is is about as queer as it's possible to be coded. Monique's last name, Valentine, comes from Orsino's servant, and I'm not having any luck making a direct connection there, but you know, we respect a vibes-based choice. Malcolm, the obnoxious dorm director with a never-gonna-happen crush on Olivia, mm, I hate that guy. is a pretty clear stand-in for the play's Malvolio, Olivia's steward, who pursues her romantically because the rest of the household is super annoyed with how obsessive about rules and full of himself he is, so they forge a love letter from the lady of the house so he'll try to woo her and make a fool of himself. Malcolm has a pet tarantula named Malvolio, which is cute, and even better, he wears yellow socks. Definitely the most important thing happening in this shot, just like the yellow stockings that Malvolio wears because the forged love letter references how good Olivia thinks they look on him when it's actually her least favorite color and they make him look ridiculous. Malcolm's last name is also Festies. Malcolm Festies dorm director. Who is also a character from Twelfth Night, but I would call that homage somewhat off-base, because, I mean, Festes is a fool, but he's a Shakespearean fool, as in the vocation, which means he's a pretty clued-in and observant dude who's always ready with a song or a bout of witty repartee, and who everyone pretty much likes. If you ask me, the closest analog in She's the Man is actually probably David Cross as Principal Gold, but I might just be saying that because I desperately want him to be the queer icon we deserve in 2022 and not the inherent punchline he was almost certainly intended to read as in 2006. And of course there's this fucking monstrosity. It's just like what coach says before every game. Be not afraid of greatness. That I have already thoroughly dressed down in my video on Astrologaster, although I will say, as some of you pointed out in the comments, I failed to properly mention that that line is also definitely a dick joke. Some are born great. Some achieve greatness. Some have greatness thrust upon them. Is it just me or does this soccer game have more nudity than most? Much more subtly, when Viola hypes herself up to be a manly dude. You're the man. Yes, I am. It's very possible to read it as an allusion to one of the most famous speeches in all of Shakespeare. I left no ring with her. What means this lady? One of my lord's ring? 
Why she sent her none? I am the man. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I know if you're not a giant dork, it's no be not afraid of greatness. But this is like, if you're an actor, this soliloquy is actually a huge risk to do in an audition because it's so done. So I know it maybe feels like a stretch to call I'm the man a reference, but I swear it's a thing. And the scenes where Viola helps Duke work on his ability to talk to women by just being her girl self in boys' clothing. I'm Viola. Duke, nice to meet you. Okay, that was creepy. You really just sounded like a girl just then. Come pretty directly from another of Shakespeare's cross-dressing comedies, As You Like It, which did the same thing, only honestly gayer. Now, in terms of bigger picture adaptation stuff, the decision to have Viola temporarily impersonating her brother while also keeping up some amount of her own life is an absolutely brilliant choice for modernizing this story. It's not just the language and the setting that could use an update for a modern-ish day teenage audience, there's also the structure of the romantic comedy. An Elizabethan comedy could be more or less anything as long as it ended in a wedding. Look up the plot of technically a comedy measure for measure if you want to ruin your day. The coupling off at the end was structurally such a foregone conclusion that a modern audience may not necessarily be sold on the building of the relationship. And in the case of Twelfth Night, you're also dealing with a pretty inactive protagonist, especially as far as her romance is concerned. Viola is kind of emotionally treading water. She empathizes with Orsino's unrequited love, and she uses that empathy both to make Orsino's case to Olivia. If I did love you in my master's flame, with such a suffering, such a deadly life, in your denial I would find no sense. I would not understand it! And to kind of suggest to Orsino that maybe, as much as it sucks, it's time to listen to Olivia's goddamn words. Say that some lady, as perhaps there is, hath for your love as great a pang of heart as you have for Olivia. You cannot love her. You tell her so. Must she not then be answered? But the idea of acting on her feelings for Orsino is pretty much entirely out of the question in any capacity. Not only because of the whole cross-dressing thing, but because she's just been through a tragedy that's made her future pretty unclear. Her stakes have much more to do with whether her brother is alive somewhere out there and whether they'll ever be reunited. She is the man very smartly narrows this scope by tossing the tragic backstory and gives Viola a lot more agency and direct stake in the romance. She has a date on the calendar when the real Sebastian will come take over his life and she'll go back to being Viola full time. She can acknowledge Viola's existence to Duke. I used to imitate my sister all the time. I got really good at it. She even gets to introduce him to Viola. So her romantic interest isn't confined to quiet wallowing. It's an active desire she is able to pursue in ways that conflict both with Duke and Olivia's wants and with her own need to keep up the act until the big game. It makes for the kind of love polygon that is an utter nail-biting delight to watch and absolutely functions in an era where we want our romantic comedies to be about the journey, not just the destination. Destination. But you know, none of this is why we're here. No. We are here, my children, because this is a movie about gender. Now, it is of course important to acknowledge that it is a pretty limited take, a purely cis, binary, and heteronormative view of the world. This is pre-transgender tipping point. This is before Thomas Beatty graced the cover of People magazine. This is genitals determine gender level shit in the most explicit and literal way. There are severe limitations. But I still think it's worth discussing, and here's why. That binary model of gender that is so linked to heteronormativity is one with which a lot of people identify. It is not only the society that we live in, but a big chunk of the framework through which a lot of us interact with it. And listen. My siblings in cisgenderism, my brothers and sisters, if you will. We still fucking have gender! Just because the current default settings happen to work for us doesn't mean we don't have a settings panel. But we, my fine fellows still on our first gender friends, have a tendency to pretend that we just don't have to deal with that shit. And that is dangerous. 
That way lies defining your gender purely in opposition to whatever you imagine is the most personally destabilizing thing a trans person could possibly be thinking. That way lies Joanne. And you don't want to be a Joanne, do you? Of course not, you're way too cool for that. So, let's unpack some baggage from a movie made in 2006. It's only a starting point, but we gotta start. Maybe this movie's most forefront point is about emotional intimacy amongst boys and men. Straight masculinity tends to demand that boys and men present themselves as above feelings, especially to one another. Oh my god, you're bleeding, are you okay? Um... <clears throat> I mean, suck it up! Be a man! I'm but of course this doesn't mean that boys and men don't have emotions or don't need to express them. It just puts limits on the places where they feel safe to do so. A lot of folks, myself included, have pointed out how much pressure this can put on women, especially romantic partners, to satisfy every emotionally vulnerable need for the men in their lives. But She's the Man presents a particularly interesting counterpoint to this in Duke and Viola's relationship. Despite the fact that that Duke perceives Viola as another boy, as they get to know each other, he eventually feels comfortable showing a masculine kind of vulnerability and emotional honesty. What I just told you is for your ears only. If you tell anyone, I'll kick your ass. In fact, it's maybe because he perceives her as a boy that he's able to feel so comfortable. You know, maybe if I'd have known you were a girl, we wouldn't have talked like we did and got to know each other the same way. See, for all his studliness, Duke kind of freezes up around girls. He is essentially incapable of having a conversation with the girl he's been pining after for god knows how long. This is its own too common issue that has its roots in straight nonsense where talking to girls really means picking up women. Getting to know the opposite sex, are we? <laughs> Male-female dynamics, all that, sexual tension. This is Twitter threads about how partnered folks shouldn't seek friendships outside their own gender that are apparently still being written in the year of our lord 2022. This is every summer camp with a no purpling rule. You know the tune even if you need to be reminded of the words. But She's the Man actually has an answer to that too. When Duke says that he doesn't know how to talk to Olivia, he, consciously or not, means that he doesn't know how to get her to go on a date with him. And Viola, consciously or not, redirects him back to the fact that he's literally just talking about having a conversation. Ask me some questions, and if the chemistry's right, things will just start flowing. Ask me if I like cheese. And this, at least, starts to disrupt the cycle. So, um, do you like cheese? But for the moment, Duke doesn't realize he already is talking to a girl. What helps him open up isn't the change in the gender dynamic in and of itself. It's the way Viola, even as a boy, treats him. She asks real questions. She listens to his answers. She opens up in a way that makes space for him to do the same. This kind of behavior is generally encouraged in girls and young women, while it can often be punished for boys and young men. But this is a learned pattern. When given the space and opportunity, anyone of any gender can develop these skills, and it's personally and socially rewarding when we do. And uh, side note, back in my youth and children's ministry days, one of my co-workers was trying out this high school youth group curriculum that had a day for talking about gender, and I don't know if it was a little old or if it was just written by people who were out of touch with what the kids were into in 2015, but the conversation starter for masculinity was one of these Duke and Viola scenes. And ancient artifact or not, we had a really meaningful little chat that I think everyone got something out of. And then the example for femininity was the Reliant K song Mood Rings. If it's drama you want, then look no further. Let's get emotional girls to all wear mood rings. And every kid in the room, the boys especially, was like, well that's just misogyny. And boy does that give me hope for the future. Uh, 
Another idea that gets a lot of exploration in She's the Man is heteronormative dating, romance, and sexual desire. Not just for its own sake, but in the way it specifically plays into gender performance. First, there's Viola and her jock boyfriend Justin. We get to see how he treats her in private versus in front of his soccer team in quick succession. Okay, you are really getting good. Really? Absolutely. Probably already better than half the guys on my team. <laughs> Yesterday you told me that I was better than half the guys on your team. <laughs> I never said that. Now, how good Justin actually believes Viola is at soccer is up for interpretation, but regardless of his real feelings, these are two performances that feed into his version of masculinity and the role his girlfriend serves in preserving it. The private performance for Viola is a little more subtle, but immediately noticeable to anyone who has dated this type of guy, which is that Justin to some extent, credits himself for Viola's talent. The public performance is a little more obvious. Justin's guy's guy image is the big strong dude who is obviously bigger and stronger than his girlfriend and won't stand for her mouthing off. End of discussion. Viola calls his bluff, and that's embarrassing and emasculating. Fine. End of relationship. So he's still got something to prove when he sees her making out with Duke, despite the fact that she unilaterally dumped him. And this is a kissing booth at a charity carnival. This is literally Viola's volunteer job right now, which is exactly where the act becomes so transparent. This is not really about Justin's feelings for Viola. It's all about his ego. She traded him up for the manlier model. I made him cry once during a game. I did not cry during that game, I had something in my eye. So he's gotta prove that he's the one with the bigger dick. The one who is the bigger dick. Then there's Sebastian and Monique. Monique is a jerk and Sebastian knows she's a jerk, but- She's hot. It's a guy thing. Hot take, Sebastian is the worst and I can only hope Olivia knows she can't fix him. This is how this guy talks about his girlfriend to his sister. This is how Viola has learned that guys talk about girls, and when she needs to perform guyhood, that's more or less what she replicates. What does your heart tell you? Huh? I mean, which one would you rather see naked? Monique, meanwhile, like Justin, sees her relationship status as crucial to her femininity. Her gendered power is about being so desirable that she's able to call the shots. Girls with asses like mine, do not talk to boys with faces like yours. So getting publicly and brutally dumped, technically by Viola, but Monique doesn't know that, is the entire blow on its own. Sebastian doesn't need to kiss anyone new for it to be deeply embarrassing that he doesn't want to kiss her, again, as far as she knows. It's maybe worse that his only justification is that she's not enough for him. When my eyes are closed, I see you for what you truly are, which is ugly. For Monique, desirability and femininity are synonymous, which is one of our sexist-ass society's favorite things to teach women and then shame us for believing. You don't want to be a big-headed fuck like Monique, you want to be like Olivia, who also uses her sexual desirability to manipulate the men in her life, but she doesn't have an ego about it, you know what I mean? So what do you do? You just pretend to like somebody else? Mm -hmm and then use him shamelessly. And of course, all the power Monique loses in the breakup, Viola gains. She is such a manly dude that she can have a girl with an ass like that who doesn't talk to boys with faces like yours and still be the one to do the dumping. It is Monique who is whipped, not Viola. Sebastian, whatever. Paul knows this, which is why the whole lead into this breakup is a literal performance where his pretty friends put on a show of being really into Viola and she turns them down, thus proving her worthy of being welcomed as one of the guys. You're officially my idol now. To leer after a pretty girl is boyish, to be desired by her is manly. Which brings us back to our badass hunks of dude who are all compensating for something in the bonding ritual of leering after pretty girls. Viola is obviously impersonating her brother, pretty straightforward. Duke feels some level of emasculated by his thus far unrequited desire for Olivia, so he channels this into performative chivalry that allows him to assert possession over her without needing her participation or consent. Check out the booty on that blonde. 
Uh oh, don't talk about her that way. Andrew, we eventually find out, likes boys. This is woke LeFou levels of easy to miss, but impossible to deny. He ends the movie with Paul at the cotillion, and they're pretty adorable. Since he's such a minor character, we don't really know much more than that. Is he bi or pan, or is all of his locker room talk pure beardly performance? Does he already know he likes boys, or is this a new thing for him? I'd argue the fact that by the end of the movie, he's on a date in a setting that is largely about the most stick-up-the-butt rich people in a town that is probably in the southern United States. I'm gonna wear that Carolina blue. Yeah. Getting to judge each other in 2006, uh, suggests he's pretty well grounded in this particular part of his identity, but who knows? In any case, liking boys at all is one of the quickest and surest threats to one's heteronormative masculinity in the eyes of the fellas, the council whomst make the call of what is and is not gay. So whether it's pure artifice, an amped up version of something he actually feels, or straightforward denial, Andrew locker room talk is super performative. Hey there, pretty lady. Ew. But what are you, hitting on me? Oh. And then there's Toby, who carries a torch for Eunice. He is so consistent about this, the whole movie. He thinks this girl is hot. He wants to date her. She got a little something something. But he does not, explicitly because that wouldn't be a socially acceptable thing to do. Okay, how come when I wanted to ask out Eunice, everyone made fun of me? But now Sebastian likes her and suddenly she's cool? Screw you guys, I hate high school. Because Eunice is, well, she's a character in a 2000s teen comedy named Eunice. She wears ortho Donic headgear, what more do you need? Man, Eunice is like, I have more weird feelings about Eunice in this movie than I do about most things, and that's saying something. The role is played by Emily Perkins, also known as the horror icon who brought us Bridget Fitzgerald and Beverly Marsh herself. She apparently started with just a few lines, but just owned it so hard that the part was expanded to a significant ensemble player. When we did the reading, she creepily said the line, I'm gonna be the best lab partner you've ever had. So we lost it. First thing we said was, give this girl more line. As a character, she is constantly teetering right on the edge of being just an unqualified fucking queen. 2005, 2006, 2007, nice night, 2008. But she's still a character in a 2000s teen comedy named Eunice. Her defining quirk is that she's so eager to be involved with her peers socially. I bet Eunice is available. I'm so there, it's insane. And it's like the writers are so close to genuine empathy for the amount of outright dismissal and probably bullying she's been through. Of course she's excited by the idea that people would actually want to spend time with her. I've never had a roommate before. Like, obviously she loses her mind a little bit when she's suddenly on a date with Channing Tatum for fucking out loud. Do you like cheese? More than almost any other animal byproduct. That's more coherent than I'd be able to manage. But you know, as careful and deliberate as this movie is about the way it portrays masculinity, it falls right into the trap of unexamined stereotypes of femininity. Overt sexual interest is great when it's a pretty blonde girl, but when it's a nerd with a visible medical aid, it's the first sign that she's super creepy. Eunice, why didn't you wake me? You looked so serene make literally no change to this character except for replacing the headgear with a ukulele and she'd be an obvious romantic lead. I made breakfast, darling. But sure, it's funny when girl you would never bang wanna bang. Soccer is the world's favorite sport. All of that said, having Toby finally confess his feelings is a super prescient observation about the way sexual desire and romantic attraction actually do take some separating from social pressure. Societal standards of beauty are prescriptive not descriptive. People are attracted to all kinds of bodies, all kinds of looks, all kinds of non-physical attributes, but there are only a small handful that the wider culture labels as attractive. What any individual person actually wants may or may not line up with what they have been told to want, what they will be socially rewarded for having. And it takes a good bit of self-awareness and a whole lot of self-confidence to separate the two. For an extreme example of this, look at the incel concept of sexual market value. 
if it were really just about who they personally want to sleep with, they wouldn't need an IPO valuation. So for Toby, going after the girl he's actually attracted to means putting his image as a manly jock on the line. But once his whole concept of everything gets a little rocked, he wisely decides it's worth it. I think you are amazing. <laughs> And I'm not ashamed of it. Contrast this with Olivia, who seemingly does not feel threatened at all by her feelings for Viola. She's into her even before the rest of the boys stamp her man card, and she likes her specifically because Viola isn't the big manly type she's more or less supposed to want. The whole dissecting thing kind of freaks me out. Wow. Most guys would never admit that. <laughs> oh crap, you're right. And she feels no shame about going after her beyond being a little discouraged by her lack of obvious interest. But he said I'm not his type. But that's impossible. You're everyone's type. Not his. Some of this is definitely that Olivia as a character is pretty settled in herself in a way that Toby isn't, but some of it also speaks to the way that this pressure affects men and women differently, again specifically in a cis-heteronormative framework. The standards for what types of women are considered attractive, again in the societal beauty standard sense, not in the sense of what any individual person is actually attracted to, are significantly narrower than they are for men. So the standards for what kind of woman a manly man is supposed to date or sleep with, or admit to sleeping with, are significantly narrower than when the shoe's on the other foot. When that criminally heterosexual practice of rating attractiveness on a scale from 1 to 10 comes out, straight men are most likely to be talking about women. Straight women are most likely to be talking about themselves. Monique and Sebastian are the nightmare end scenario of this, a couple who really don't seem to like anything about each other except how good they make each other look. Just remind your brother how lucky he is to be in my life and tell him to give me a call if he wants to stay in it. She's hot. But Toby and Eunice remind us that with a little introspection and a little fuck it energy, there's a better way. <laughs> All right, here's an easy one. This is a sports movie. Our inciting incident is that a girl isn't allowed to play on the boys' soccer team because the coach assumes girls, as a rule, can't hack it. It's a scientific fact. Now, at first, it might seem like this movie basically agrees that there are simply biological differences between the cis genders. Viola is really good at soccer by the standards of the Cornwall girls team, but when she tries out for the Illyria boys team, she's clearly out of her depth and gets relegated to second string. Girl can't keep up with boys. But that's not the end of the discussion. The gender of the team isn't the only variable that's been changed here. Viola's also playing at a different school. And after the tryouts, the Illyria boys make it clear that means she's playing in a whole new league. So the game against Cornwall, that should be interesting, huh? And why would that be interesting? The so-called rivalry between Cornwall and Illyria is actually pretty one-sided, which is gonna have the attentive viewer already questioning whether we've been led down a garden path by this assumption that Viola's gender is the reason she can't keep up on the soccer field. This keeps going all the way up to the actual final game, which does come out close enough for a sports movie climax. And the penalty kick will decide the game! But on a day when Illyria's captain is riding the weirdest emotional roller coaster of his life, and another member of their starting lineup spends half the game replaced by a guy who clearly hasn't touched a soccer ball since fourth grade PE. And much more importantly, as soon as she's training with the Illyria boys and getting some extra one on one coaching from Duke, Viola improves so quickly that she gets promoted to first string in less than two weeks. And she is able to do that specifically because no Nobody questions that she's capable of training hard enough to get there. I'll work with you on your soccer. I'll make you good enough to make first string. By the Cornwall game? Absolutely. Biological differences when it comes to gender and athletic performance are a really difficult thing to study because those biological differences come with social differences that are incredibly difficult to control for. How do you account for physical education where teachers at least subconsciously treat students differently based on the box checked on their rosters from the time kids start having a gym class? Or that the vast majority of athletic teams get the separate but equal treatment? Outside of organized sports, what about the wildly different cultures around fitness in publications aimed at men versus 
women, or how few gatekeepy or butt ogling dudes it takes to make the weight room feel hostile to how many women. And that's even assuming everyone is cis. Which they're not. Interestingly enough, we actually learn later that there's a league rule preventing co-ed teams. There's no girls in this league. Here, look in the manual. What manual? But the Cornwall coach feels no shame about being openly discriminatory based on his personal opinions instead. Girls can't be boys. It's as simple as that. This is what American phys ed looks like. So while she's the man doesn't discount the possibility that some inherent biological differences between cis men and cis women might affect the way they play soccer, Viola does have to train extra hard outside of regular practice to get up to snuff after all, it is much more concerned with the fact that a person who is unquestioningly assumed to have the physical capability to keep up and is given the opportunity to train like such capability exists has a much better chance of doing so than someone who can't even get in the door. Biology may be some level of hurdle, but socially informed opinions about biology are a far more significant barrier. Also, as I was working on this video, Film Fatales released a piece about more sort of policy and praxis-based feminism in both She's the Man and 10 Things I Hate About You that gets into the sort of exceptional woman situation of Viola being the only Cornwall girl who gets to play after the team is cut. So if you want to check that out, I'll put a link in the description. Okay. Let's finally talk about Viola on her own terms. It is clear from very early on that Viola is deeply uncomfortable with the high femme role her mother wants her to inhabit. Mom, have I not told you a thousand times I have no interest in being a debutante? She is drawn to interests traditionally considered boy stuff. Her presentation is mask enough that she is sometimes mistaken for her brother even before deliberately impersonating him. God, you and your brother look scary alike from the back. She is obviously out of place and uncomfortable in girl spaces. It is not unusual for the people around her to see her as barely even, if at all, female. Sometimes I just think you just might as well be your brother. You can just be a girl for five seconds, huh? When she takes on the identity of Sebastian, though, she is accepted as a boy without question. In the moments where she slips and gets a little femmy, the people around her generally write it off as a weird quirk of her personality that might make her worth laughing at, but does not make her less male. While it does take her a little time to get her bearings and a little work to gain the respect of the other boys, once she does, she is entirely accepted and relatively at ease moving through this social space. There's even a moment when Olivia is talking to girl mode Viola about how attractive she finds Sebastian, by which at this point she means boy mode Viola, and Viola clearly likes hearing herself described this way. When he smiles, I just can't stop looking at him. <laughs> You see what I'm saying, right? Could Viola be trans? You know, maybe. I don't think I'm really the right person to do that reading justice, but I absolutely support anyone who likes it, anywhere on the scale from She's the Man headcanon to explicitly interpretive performance of Twelfth Night. Although, if you're gonna go that route, may I just, you know, also, in addition, suggest to you the slightly less well-known but no less ripe for queering As You Like It, which I already mentioned has some influence on She's the Man. That plays cross-dressing lead, Rosalind, doesn't even have a socially necessary plausible deniability reason for it like Viola does. They're just like, well, I'm tall, so if we're gonna run away from polite society and live in the woods, I might as well dress as a man. Like, technically they're bouncing off their cousin Celia's worry that thieves might target them, but they're also already traveling with a male friend and Celia still dresses like a woman. There's a really clear argument to be made that Rosalind just feels like being a boy, either all of the time or with some fluidity. They've already got a name picked out and everything, and their love interest is absolutely into them in both girl mode and boy mode. Do with that what you will. Point being, I don't want to take trans Viola away from anyone who resonates with that reading. But I do want to also give you the reading that resonates with me on a personal level. Which is, maybe, if Viola wanted to keep living as a boy, she would do that. Maybe being Sebastian for a little while makes it clear to her that that's an option. That gender isn't nearly as immutable as her mother and her soccer coach and her nightmare ex-boyfriend want it to be. And if she wants to be a boy, if she is a boy, she can just be a boy. And maybe learning that ultimately makes her feel more like a girl. 
like the kind of girl she is. Like the kind of girl who gets to decide what being a girl means for her. I think that's probably a lot to put on a movie from 2006 that isn't afraid to imply that being trans is a mental illness. Sebastian Hastings is a girl, for reasons which will become very clear after extensive psychoanalysis. But you know, death of the fucking author, that's still my viola, because... That's my experience, too. I have had, shall we say, a complicated relationship to my own gender. I definitely went through a long period where I felt like I sort of had to prove I was a girl to myself and everyone around me because I didn't really feel connected to it, but it seemed like if I weren't enough of a girl, that would be just one more irreparably weird thing about me, and I had too many of those to deal with already. And then I kind of swung back the other way and went through a stage of being an absolutely insufferable no-log, and not just in the performative pick-me kind of way, like in a way that went all the way down to my sense of self. Like one time I was at a college party and it got shut down by the RA, so we were reconvening at an off-campus apartment, and I and a couple of my friends who lived in the dorm a block away stopped by home because, I mean in my case, because I was wearing four-inch heels which were fine for popping across the street, but not for trekking 10 blocks uptown. And the one dude friend who was with us was like, okay, you've got 10 minutes. If you're not back down in the lobby at 10.15, I'm leaving without you. And I was like, what are you talking about? It does not take that long to put on a change of shoes. I'll be back in seven if I decide to pee. And he was like, oh, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to them. And I was just like, yes, I did it. He doesn't think of me as a girl! And this is when I started learning about gender on a level beyond, like, like how it goes down in She's the Man. That binary trans and non-binary people existed and were, like, normal people. That there could be multiple axes, like identity and presentation, and they didn't have to align with one another or with your genitals. I mean, this is all intro level and clumsy as fuck. I was learning literally from Tumblr, but it just, it made sense to me. I got so curious about it. I went through a period where I described myself as someone who identified as female but presented kinda male, which I mean is fucking hilarious. That was just internalized misogyny, but you know, teenagers should be allowed to be hilariously wrong for a little bit about stuff that doesn't hurt anyone. It's an important stage of figuring shit out. I was also really into pants roles around this time, which if you don't know is when a woman plays a male character in a play and it's super common practice in classical theater. It's totally normal to see a cis actress with her hair back in a ponytail and wearing a suit jacket or something, and you just sort of accept that she's playing a man, even if she doesn't necessarily look or sound like one. And I fucking, I love that shit. A friend I'd known more or less my whole life actually started transitioning around this time too. So I even had an example of what that could look like, someone I would have felt totally safe and comfortable talking to. The possibility that that I could be trans was something that definitely existed for me when I was relatively young. Maybe to less of an extent than it does for kids and young adults now, 10 plus years later, when like my priest has his pronouns in his email signature. But I mean, Laura Jane Grace came out in Rolling Stone right around then. I knew it was a thing, and I thought about it in relation to my understanding of myself a lot. I still do, just to kind of check in, you know? But it's just never quite felt right. I still love pants rolls, but the idea of being him all the time, never getting to take that off, makes me kind of nauseous. And I can picture the version of myself who is identical to me, but with she, they, or they, them in their bio, and they seem cool. I'd like to be their friend, but they're not me. Not because I don't know about the idea of being trans, not because I don't know trans people, not even because I know that being trans would probably make my life materially, legally, medically more difficult in a lot of ways. Just because I'm not trans. At least not that I'm aware of right now. It's a long life. Who knows? I know who I am. And I know who I am because I have the tools to know that I could be someone else. I might not have actually tried living my life as that person, but I have sincerely questioned if I could be them. Questioned if a different way of looking at myself might make more sense than what a doctor told my parents when I was five minutes old. And I continue that questioning with a spirit of curiosity and with an open heart and mind and without fear. 
I know who I am because I know that my understanding of myself could change at any time and that might be scary, but it would also be beautiful. And that's something absolutely everyone should have. Thank you so much to all of my patrons for making these videos possible, with an extra special thank you to Alexander Brogan, Patrick Berenger, Brett C.S., Data Fox, Madeline Capper, Ilona Concetta, Richard Lawson, and Michelle. If you'd like to help support my work directly, the best way to do that is at patreon.com slash laurachrone, or you can also throw me a one-time tip on PayPal. 